Hey everyone, in this video we're going to cover uh, the next part of our series on JASP, which is repeated measures one way ANOVAs. So if you've been following along, we've just finished covering between subjects ANOVAs, and now we're going to hit up repeated measures. So in the between subjects ANOVA video, we talked about how research design is so critical in statistical testing, and we made the relationship between independent T and between subjects ANOVAs, such that if you have an independent design where each group is a different separate group of people, then you need to make sure you use an independent test. So for between subjects, we used an independent T, right? And um, that meant when you got up to three groups or more, you used between subjects and OVA. Same issue applies here. Let's say we have three groups or more that we're um, testing multiple times. That would be repeated measures ANOVA, which is sometimes called dependent T or paired samples T because we can't have nice things and no one keeps the names the same, right? So this video is going to cover repeated measures ANOVA, right, which is an extension of that paired samples T test where we now have multiple, more than two groups. Now, if you only have two conditions or testing time points, the repeated measures ANOVA and the paired sample t-test are the exact same thing. Right? But really you move up to ANOVA when you have three or more groups. And we talked about how that's because you want to control for type one error because the more tests that you run pairwise to you know, group one versus group two, group two versus group three, et cetera, the more likely you are to find something that maybe isn't correct. Right? So the ANOVA gives us an overall or omnibus test, which allows us to tell if there are any group differences at all before we go investigating every possible combination. Okay. So here's some examples of when you might use a repeated measures ANOVA. Um, we'd need at least one independent variable that's categorical with three or more related groups. So maybe something like three different measurement time points, or in my own research, we give people different judgment types. So sometimes they have to guess one type of numbers and other type of numbers. So we make them make judgments on how meaningful things are, how valent they are, and how dominant they are, for example. It's the same subjects in each of those conditions, and now we have three different scores for them. So we need three different groups, and then at least one independent variable that's continuous. The thing I see students struggle with the most on repeated measures ANOVA is it seems like you don't really have both of those things. So when people um, kind of have these designs, especially with the way that they're laid out in most programs for analyzing the data, it doesn't seem like you have an independent variable. So let's go ahead and open JASP and I'll show you how, what I mean here. So I'm going to open this data. I'm going to click the hamburger icon. Click open computer guides. And let's look at repeated measures ANOVA. And if you've been following along in this series, I've actually told you not to do it this way. Because generally what we have is um, what's called tidy data, where each person uh, gets their own row. But we might also think about data as each measurement gets its own row. When you have repeated measures data, we want to stick with each person getting their own row, right? So this is the same person three times. When, what I warned you about for independent tests was putting like men in one column and women in another, for example. Okay. So when we look at independent data, which I'm just going to open our between subjects data, okay, what we have is one column for the IV and one column for the DV. So the groups are really clear, and the score of the dependent variable is really clear. When you have repeated measures data, maybe this isn't so clear. Okay, these are the groups, so we have pre, mid, and post, and these are the dependent variables. Okay. I wish all programs sort of forced you to do this the other way, but um, this hopefully at least makes it clear that each person is their own row. So I have multiple measurements for each person. So for, for what I've seen students struggle with is this idea that these are not three dependent variables. It's one dependent variable measured three times. 
Okay, so that's a key distinction there. Okay, so these are the essentially the IV, the group I, group levels, and then the number itself is the dependent variable. Okay, so here's some examples of some designs we might use. If we, um, repeated measures is very popular for time point or long, longitudinal designs where we measure people over time. So you might measure them pre, you might give them some sort of intervention, get them to do something and then measure post, right? So we can measure things at time one, time two, time three, that sort of thing. We could have a study design where people do things in three different ways. So let's say we're interested in lighting and its effect because we're not sure about these phones and their blue light, right? So we could compare blue lights versus red lights versus green lights. We could have three different groups who are doing three different diets, that kind of thing. I'm sorry, three different uh, diet tests on the same people. I almost said that wrong. We could think about those change scores now we talked about change scores in the last video, and this is where this, this sort of uh, analysis occurs when you have people who've taken the same thing over and over again. So let's say we are implementing a brand new statistics class and we wanna know if people get better. So every two weeks, we're gonna give people a different type of study design. So we give them a pretest and a post-test at the beginning of every two weeks. And so we measure them in little two-week chunks. So they get quizzes and we um, do a new fancy statistical dance and see if they've learned anything. Now it's repeated measures because it's the same people measured every two weeks and we take their pre and post scores and subtract them. So we have a change score. How much do they learn in each of those two-week chunks? That might be repeated measures because even after we calculate those change scores, everybody's still the same. So the big distinction, if you're trying to figure out is this repeated measures or is this between subjects, is um, are the groups different people or are the groups the same people? Okay. Last, we might um, measure people on different variables. So we might say, well, let's measure you on this IQ scale on that IQ scale and see if there are any differences. So just some examples of when you use repeated measures, but the main key takeaway here is that the people are the same. The scores represent the same person multiple times. Okay. Now, mostly you'll notice that the assumptions are the same, okay, as what we've been doing. We have one dependent variable that's continuous. We've been using that one all, to, all in all of these videos. You have one independent variable or more independent variables, we're gonna stick with one here, that is three or more separate measurements. You'll notice we've dropped one, we've dropped the independence assumption because we know in this type of design that the people are not independent. Okay? It's the same person tested over and over again, so we're using special math to help control for that. The, there shouldn't be any outliers, the sampling distribution should be normal, and we'll look at our dependent variable as a, as a measure for that. And then this one is the new one. Okay. When we had separate groups of people, we asked if there were homo if the, the variances between groups were homogeneic, right? Meaning they were um, the same variance across groups. This is a similar type of test where we're going to test for sporicity in that we're interested if the different scores have the same variances. So if you have three conditions, one, two, three, there's a different score between one and two, one and three, and two and three, right? Do those different scores have the same variances? Okay. So remember in dependent T, we calculated a different score to kind of like look and see if things were normal. And uh, that's the same idea here, where they calculate all of the different different scores to see if they have roughly equal variance. You're also interested in the correlations between levels, um, but for our purposes, as long as you get the idea that it's similar to the idea of homogeneity of variances, so we're interested if the variances are the same um, between the different scores. And just like we've said before, ANOVA is fairly robust to these violations, so we need things to be um, close, but it's okay if they're not perfect. 
And so most of the discussion about post hoc tests and omnibus tests and effect sizes for ANOVA is discussed in the one way between subjects design. So if you need a little bit more on this idea of what is a post hoc test and why are the effect sizes different, you can go back and watch that one. All right, so the null hypothesis is the exact same as a between subjects design. It's essentially this idea that all the group means are equal. Um, remember, there's no um, one tailed option here. It's all two tailed because the F test, remember the variance formula from a million years ago is squared. So you can't have a negative score. So we can't do one tail test. So the null hypothesis is the, the equal one, basically that all these groups are equal. There's no differences. Nothing happened. The alternative test is that something happened, but we're not quite sure where. And we'll use our investigative skills to determine where something happened if the omnibus test is significant. So in our detective example, essentially we have to find enough evidence that something happened, and then we're going to go investigate where something happened in our post hoc test. Okay, so we were to reject the null of nothing happening. If it's not significant, we would just stop and say, well, we don't have enough evidence that something happened and we're just going to stop. All right, so let's look at this uh, heart disease reduction example. Uh, I don't know why both of these are actually about exercise, <laughs> um, but let's say we want to know, um, we give them this intervention, six month intervention. We're going to measure them pre, midway and post. So there's a good cue right there. If you're ever measuring people multiple times, this is going to be repeated measures. And we're going to measure their um, C-reactive protein. Okay. And so we've got their CRP pre before they started, midway through the program and post at the end of the program. And we're going to see if there's any change between those three time points. All right, I have already opened it. So let's check, start checking our assumptions. Is there um, at least the DV is it at least scale ratio or interval? Yes, it's ratio. We could have zero. Are there any outliers? Well, let's go look. Now, one issue here is that um, be careful with repeated measures because one thing that happens is when you're testing for outliers, it compares it against everyone else in that within that time point. And it could be that this person is just um, high, like they have a high score because they naturally have high scores. And the way I usually think about this is in a classroom example. You have some students that are A students and some students that are C students. Should I say that the C student is an outlier? Well, if they're a C student the whole time, probably not. So when I test for outliers in repeated measures, I always kind of try to think about, are they an outlier within themselves as well? So if we had, you know, 5, 4, 17, that's probably not correct because that would be very strange for that participant and that column. But to check that, we can do descriptives. Descriptives. We're going to move over all three of them. We'll just give us the descriptive stats here. But to look for outliers, first thing you can do is look at our plots, this density plots here. And we would look for scores that are very far away from the rest of them. This is also a way for us to kind of look at for normality. This is probably not an outlier because that's four to five. And, uh, you know, we don't have that many people. We have 10 people overall. Uh, so it might be hard to assess for normality as well. I'm going to click box plots, label outliers, and jitter element, the big three that we've been hitting. It's going to give us a box plot for each one. Okay, remember, this is the median. These here are the interquartile range. And this is the kind of farthest we can go before they become outliers. And finally, out of all of these different videos that we've made, we have one that's an outlier. Okay. And in our guide here, as we scroll past all these plots, we actually included like a big warning, like this is the outlier. Okay, so what does that five mean? Okay, that doesn't mean the score is five. It means it's row five on CRP post. So let's, sorry, go back to the data by clicking this little arrow. Row five, CRP post. Okay, so that score, 4.6, would be considered an outlier. Probably 
because all of the other scores are in the threes, basically. So the one four, so it's the highest score. Now, when I look at the rows for each participant, you know, they're mostly all going down, which is a good thing. Um, but is 4.6 an outlier for that row? Probably not. I mean, if you look, they're going down pretty evenly from 5.4 to 5. So they started higher than everyone else. So yeah, that score is an outlier for this time point, but maybe is not that irregular when we consider the entire participant. All right, so we, we got a, just an example to remind you what this is, the row for that participant. Okay. And we're gonna leave them in, in our particular data point, where we'd say we have one outlier. Um, we really don't have that many participants, so we don't wanna lose all of their data. And as long as it looks like it's kind of in um, in the same range that that participant normally gets, uh, we would probably keep it in. Now, there are other ways to test like each participant if it's an outlier for them, but um, that gets us beyond what JASP is currently capable of. All right. So then we want to ask about normal distributions. We've been using the Shapiro Wilk this whole time, and so we're going to keep using it. Um, yeah, and then I'm going to briefly pause and let the dog in or she's about to start barking. <laughs> Come on. All right, so now we have company. Extra puppy help. All right, so is that dependent variable normally distributed? All right. So remember, we actually care if the sampling distribution is normally distributed, which means we need probably to have a larger sample, but we could add the Shapiro-Wilkes test Boop. here under statistics, distribution, Shapiro-Wilkes, and that's going to pop up up here in our descriptive statistics box. All right, so let's highlight the p-value row, because if you watched the last video, I looked at the wrong row, and so this is the one we're interested in. And none of those are significant. Remember that for an assumptions test, we don't want this to be significant because that would be significantly bad. And we don't want our assumptions to fail. Okay. And so we should probably okay. These are very small sample sizes. So it would be hard for the sampling distribution to be normal. But remember that ANOVA is robust to violations of normality. But we should be careful generalizing this study to other studies because we only have 10 participants. And that's another thing students tend to do is they look at the scores here and it says 10, 10, 10. So you would think you have 30 participants, but remember each person is tested multiple times. So there are only 10 rows of data. Okay, so we have 10 participants and 30 scores. The next one though, let's look at this sporicity thing. This is fairly new. All right, so I'm gonna run my ANOVA, I click ANOVA. I have one or more repeated measures. So I have to click repeated measures here. And this is where this is gonna get um, a little bit more complicated than before. So what we're gonna do is move our pre, mid, and post over into repeated measure cells, but you'll notice that it won't let me. So what I have to do is add that extra level three. I don't wanna rename these because naming it level one is not very helpful. So I'm just gonna name it pre. And then mid. And then I'm gonna add a third one, post. And once I add that third one, it will now let me move this box here. So you want to line these up so they match pre to pre, mid to mid, post to post. So don't leave them as level one, two, three, because that is not very informative. Okay? You can even change this, the name of the variable itself too, uh, time point, if you want. And that just will help you keep it straight. This independent variable is the time that we measure them. We measure them pre, middle of the test, and post. And here are the three columns that line up with that. This just helps me keep it straight that this is the independent variable and the dependent variable here is the score on this protein. All right. However, we were trying to get into sporicity here. So let's go down to assumptions tests and click sporicity. If you don't meet the assumption of sporicity, thankfully there's some corrections right here that we can add. 
So just like before, if we didn't meet the assumption of homogeneity, we could add that Welch's test. We can do the same thing with sporicity and add one of these corrections. So let's look here at what sporicity puts out for us. Okay. The test is called Mockley's. And it's this idea that the variances of the differences are equal and the correlation between the levels are all equal. And violation is when these groups, the like, correlations with the variances are not equal. Okay. It's similar to this idea of homogeneity of variances in Levine's test. Um, the test, just like Levine's, has its critics, um, but it's really pretty commonly used. So the idea here is that the null hypothesis for the Mockley's test is that those variances are equal. So if this is significant, just like um, Levine's test, that means it's significantly bad and the sporicity has been violated, which is not good for us. Okay. Now, in our test here, you want to look under P, it has been violated. So we would need to do something to fix this. Okay. We would need to apply a correction so the result is still valid. Okay. To apply a correction, we would click on the sporicity correction option and um, pick one, basically. We could tell it to print out all three. I personally think you should just pick one and stick with it. How do you know which one to pick? Well, in this table here, it says this little epsilon. This little E thing right here is epsilon. Okay. And then it gives you two numbers. So let's figure out how to interpret those. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Okay, so it shows you epsilon, greenhouse geyser, and Hunfelt. The degree to which sporicity is present or not is represented by epsilon. If epsilon equals one, that means that it's exactly equal. Like sporicity is perfect. <laughs> All the variances are equal. As epsilon gets below one, the greater the differences between the, the variances in the different scores. Okay. So as epsilon gets lower, um, what we see is that there's more problems with sporicity. So the lowest value it can take is the lower bound estimate. The lower bound estimate is not shown to you in JASP. It is shown to you in SPSS, but that's okay because we get greenhouse geyser and Hunfeld. These are two different corrections that estimate epsilon um, and try to see which correction should be used. Uh, generally, the recommendation is for greenhouse geyser if epsilon is less than 0.75. However, if you have, um, sorry, this is misspelled. H-U-I, it's a strange word. <laughs> uh, Hunfeld here. Uh, if the score is greater than 0.75, you would use the, the Hunfeld. Okay. So let's scroll back up and look at it. If it's less than 0.75, use Greenhouse Geyser. If it's higher than 0.75, use Hunfeld. Okay. What do you do if you get a mixed result? You can't really go wrong with Greenhouse Geyser. Uh, most people uh, use that one. I generally say if they're both less than 0.75, use Greenhouse Geyser. If they're both higher than 0.75, use Hunfeld. If it's a mixed bag, use Greenhouse. Okay. So what we want to do since epsilon is less than 0.75, is click sporicity corrections. I would tell you just turn the other ones off. Okay. Just so that you're not confused, because it look otherwise it prints out a bunch of crap and you're not sure which one is the right one. So turn off the other two. Just use the one that you need. Okay. Alright, now the other thing we want to add is effect size. Check, check, check. And our post hoc tests. Okay, so we're gonna come down here and click additional options to get our marginal means. Okay. Keep scrolling. If I can get us to scroll, pick our um, effect sizes here, either uh, eta squared or omega squared. Okay. Then under post hoc tests, move this over. We also want to add effect size here and it auto picks home for us. So let's go back and look over here. Now this has changed just a little bit because it used to auto pick Bronf Bronferoni, <laughs> it used to pick Bonferroni for you. Okay. 
pick the one your instructor likes. There are lots of different feelings about how post hoc tests should go, which one people like for each test. I am going to pick Bonferroni in this example because it will match what we have in our guide. But this is one of those um, moments where I say, do what your instructor wants. Mm, they're very similar between Holm and Bonferroni. I have seen that it is better for lower level repeated measures, meaning you don't have six or 12 groups to use Holm. But we're going to stick with Bonferroni because it's usually taught in textbooks. Okay? That doesn't mean that it's the answer, but it's the one that probably matches what your instructor is doing. All right, so let's look at that effect. Now, in this case, we had we included everything and highlighted this specifically, just because we feel like, you know, if you click the sporicity box and forget to turn them off, we'll at least show you which one you should use. But notice here in my JASP output that I only see, oops, where did it go? Up here, I only see, I got excited and clicked on it, I'm sorry, um, the greenhouse geyser. And I think if you turn off the other ones, this will make it a lot easier for you to read. But in case you don't, this is what you do. The actual ANOVA that we're interested in is the one that's presented in the within subjects effects box. So do notice you'll get this between subjects effects box in this particular case on a one way repeated measures uh, ANOVA, ignore that box. Okay, don't let it confuse you. All right, if we did not violate the assumption of sporicity, we could use the none row, but I also wanna show you how this works. Remember when we did the Welch correction for t-tests, this is in the independent t video, and I said, well, what happens is it kind of corrects the degrees of freedom, the number of participants, by, by changing that lower to control for the, the amount of problems that you have, and this one works the same way. Okay, it's going to lower the degrees of freedom, which means we're moving our race line, our finish point further out. Okay. So we want to use our greenhouse geyser because we did violate the assumption of sporicity. Okay. We would scroll over here to the p-value and say, well, <clears throat> this um, is less than 0.05, less than our alpha, so it means that something happened on our study. Another cool thing about JASP is it does warn you, like, hey, P.S., if you couldn't read that box for Mockley's, it does say that you need to do something. Okay. Um, and then uh, kind of a description of what post hoc means, again, just kind of to remind you, if your ANOVA is statistically significant, you would probably want to run some post hoc tests to find where those differences lie. If it's not significant, you just kind of get sad and move on, right? So the, there's no need to look for differences because they're not there. So we're gonna look for those differences. And we can also look at here at our, um, our two effect sizes. And this to me really highlights some of the problems with effect sizes, right? So in this first eta squared column, what we see is it's 0.75. It has a very high, I mean 75% of the variance um, and differences is accounted for by time point. Right. But if I look at omega, it says it's 20%. So one criticism of repeated measures is the effect sizes for them are, um, they have their pros and cons, let's put it that way. Um, a lot of people like picking omega for repeated measures because it tends to not overestimate. And clearly 0.75 seems like a very large number here. So omega tends to under uh, omega tends to not overestimate, which is a very um, better accurately, more accurately estimate. Okay. There are even other options that you could pick here, like part um, generalized eta squared, which is also very popular. But I wouldn't tell you to pick that one um, unless your instructor tells you to. Okay. And that 0.75, that's actually interesting. Hold on, one second. From when we made this test, this video, uh, what's the word? From when we made this to now, it looks like they've maybe done something here. Like fixed, um, fixed that because that is totally different. So quick, let's change it. Because that does not match. 
So now it says 0.18. I bet they put in then made that generalized data squared instead of regular boring old data. So let me match, match this to what you're actually seeing here. So now this is probably generalized data squared because it matches if I click told it to show me generalized data squared. But anyways, um, main key here is that eta tends to overestimate. So a lot of people like omega, that's still true. And now um, in this updated version of JASP, it seems that they've kind of fixed that way overestimation problem. All right. So. I'm going to fix some of the code here as I go along because I didn't realize this had updated. So here's how we might report that. CRP concentration was different at the different time points of this exercise intervention. And notice here that I've used my partial degrees of freedom. So I filled in the numbers that came with the DF here so they're not a whole because I've used a correction. We're going to warn people that we use that correction in the full report. I have seen people tell me that this is incorrect because you can't have partial degrees of freedom. So make sure you tell people you're doing the correction. So hopefully it will go through the thick skulls that um, that's part of the correction and not the original math. All right, we've got again the little box that helps you understand what's going on. So F says we're doing an F test. The 1.296 is the degrees of freedom, the corrected degrees of freedom. The 11.663 is also our corrected degrees of freedom. Here's our F statistic, which isn't changing because in the math, the correction occurs on degrees of freedom and not any of the other math. P value and then our measure of effect size. You're gonna ignore that between subjects box, okay? Because we don't use it for repeated measures in OVA. What happens here is the fact that each person is their own person. The peopleness is what I call this sometimes, or just the non-independence, right? Person one is measured three times, is accounted for here. So repeated measures design, you might have heard your instructor say, has more power because we can control for the fact that person one is person one. So we know more information about each participant. So we can kind of say, well, some of that error variance, some of that variability is because they're that person and I can control for it. Okay. All right, we've already talked about Mockley's. And then here's our post hoc box, post hoc box, <laughs> post hoc test. Okay. Now remember that this Bonferroni is just a correction. So this is a, dependent samples T with a Bonferroni correction on the p-value. Okay. This is a, um, uh, every pairwise combination in one direction, so pre to, po pre to mid, pre to post, mid to post. The mean difference here is the mean difference between time, you know, time one and time two. The standard error is the standard error of the difference between time one and time two. T is our T dependent t-test score. Cohen's D here is the same as a Cohen's D for the dependent t-test. Our p-value here is our corrected p-value given the number of comparisons that we're making, which is how Bonferroni works. And so the p-value here accounts for the fact that we ran three comparisons. Now, what will we interpret? We would say these first two are significant. So from pre to mid and pre to post, there are differences, but maybe not in, in mid to post here, because that's not less than 0.05. Okay. And we also have some Cohen's D's. This is a big effect, a big effect, and this is still a pretty big effect. It's just not significant because we only have 10 people. So maybe we don't have enough power to find the differences there. Now we've got our description, descriptives, goodness, and I also ca um, calculated the marginal means here. So I'm going to include those because the marginal means are very helpful. While while the two mean columns are the same, in the um, marginal means we also get the confidence intervals. If your instructor is interested in you having that. Um, here we get the standard deviations and the sample size. So they each give us some interesting pieces of information that we could use. Okay. So what happened? I said there were two significant effects. What's happening? Well, now I can look at these scores. From pre to mid, it, low, it went down, and from pre to post, it went down. But from mid to post, maybe not on 
a large enough decrease to be important. So it's a decrease in the CRP concentration from pre to three months. And then this only reports one. And then also there should be reporting for the second one. Okay, I don't know why the second one isn't there. But this idea this is a decrease from pre to three months in the intervention, which is a statistically significant mean decrease of my P and my D value. Okay. I should also say that this is from Bonferroni. Let's make that a smaller font. All right, so let's do everything together here. Remember the rules for reporting everything together um, is to first explain the study. Well, our repeating measures in ANOVA was conducted to determine whether it was significantly significant, blah, 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 blah. Okay. I can barely talk today. There was one outlier. So we are telling people that the, the data included an outlier. And we should probably say where in the post-test measurement. That was a funny typo. All right. And the data was normally distributed for each group as assessed by the Shapiro-Wilk, blah, 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 respectively. Okay. Uh, the assumption of sporicity was violated as, as assessed by Mockley, so we're warning people. So we applied a greenhouse geyser correction. The exercise intervention elicited a statistically significant change over time when we've included our F statistic, fixed star, eta squared here, where CRP con concentration decreased from pre to three months to six months. So we're just reporting the means there. Okay. Post hoc analyses with a Bonferroni adjustment or correction revealed that the CRP concentration was decreased from pre to three months. Okay. And then I've got my p-value. Now I've already reported these means. Um, but this here is the, the change score. Okay. So here we're reporting the, the, the mean score, the regular score. Here we're reporting the change score. Okay. And then we should probably also add, just real quick, make these um, the most useful. So from pre to mid, we also have a change score of 0.05 for our standard error. Okay. So we reported our mean, let's also report. 0 0.05 okay. and that means now people can um, totally compare for themselves okay. so from pre to three and from pre to post okay, so I'm going to add scroll up here 0.12 where'd it go from pre to post but not from three months to post Okay, so we've got our mean change score of 0.29, okay, and that change here is 0.10. And that p-value is not significant. Now the effect size is still pretty large, so you could say for all of these it appears that the scores are going down with a large effect size. So all that together is how you would report everything these get kind of long, like I said, because we have a lot going on. So remember the rules. Um, tell us a little bit about the test. Tell us about your assumptions. Tell us about the omnibus uh, NOVA test and descriptives. Tell us about the post hoc test. Okay. You can also create a graph, which you should probably do in Excel. There are options to create graphs in JASP. Okay. If your instructor is okay with that, awesome. But more than likely, you may want to use um, Excel because you have a little bit more control over how the graph looks. So I can do descriptives, move this over to horizontal axis, click display error bars, okay. and it does now give me the option to label the y axis concentration, okay. which is great, but I still don't have all of the control I'd love. Right? Maybe I wanted a bar plot instead of a line graph, or I want to like make this not 3.4 to 4.6. Um, so it does give you some control, but if you know your instructor has rules about how they should look, we have a video on how to make these graphs in Excel as well. So all that together is repeated measures ANOVA, one-way repeated measures ANOVA from start to finish.